Today we're going to look at a nice problem from the 2023 Putnam exam, and this is problem A1. So let's see what we have. So we want to define the following sequence of functions, which we'll denote by f sub n, and it's the product of cosine of x times cosine of 2x all the way up to cosine of n times x. And our goal is to determine the smallest natural number n, where if we take the second derivative of f sub n and evaluate it at zero, and then take the absolute value, we get something larger than 2023. So let's maybe prove something a little bit more general, not really because it's super necessary, but just to take advantage of the situation. And what we'll prove is some sort of general shape for a second derivative of a large pro product. But maybe in order to get our heads around this, let's do a little bit of exploration first. So let's start by observing that if we have a product of g1 times g2 and we take the second derivative, well, we're going to end up with g1 double prime times g2 plus 2 times g1 prime times g2 prime plus g1 times g2 double prime. So let's maybe look at the shape of this and observe that we've got these two pink underlined terms which have like what I'll call pure second derivatives. And then we've got first derivatives spread out among the rest of the terms here with a coefficient of two. So let's keep that shape in mind while we look at the next case here, which would be g1 times g2 times g3 double prime. So, well, we can apply this formula up here to this, thinking about g2 times g3 as being our second function. So let's see, this will be g1 double prime times g2 g3, and then we'll have plus 2 times g1 prime times g2 times g3 prime, and then plus g1 times g2 g3 double prime, like that. And then, of course, well, you can use the first derivative product rule on this term, this g2 times g3 prime, and then the second derivative product rule, which we have just right above on that last term. And what you'll see is you get the following object. So we'll have g1 double prime times g2 times g3, and then plus g1 times g2 times g3, maybe g2 double prime, and then g1, g2, g3, double prime. So those are all our maybe pure second derivatives. And then we'll have two, g1, g2, g3, and then let's put the prime on g1 and g2 for this first one. And then for this second one, let's maybe put the prime on g1 and g3. And then for this third one, we'll put the prime on g2 and g3. So notice that for this next bit, we have our first derivatives equally spread out. Okay, well, I think from this, we can probably come up with some sort of guess as to the general shape of this maybe second derivative product rule, this large second derivative product rule, and perhaps it would look something like this. So g1, g2, all the way up to gn double prime will equal the sum as k goes from 1 up to n of g1 up to gk double prime times up to gn. So that would be where we have pure second derivatives. And then after that, we'll have our first derivatives equally spread. So we can write that as 2 times the sum as i goes from 1 up to well, n minus 1, but really we're going to write it as i being bigger than or equal to 1, being strictly less than j, being less than or equal to n. And then we'll have g1 all the way up to gi prime, all the way up to gj prime, all the way up to gn. So that spreads out evenly our first derivatives. And then maybe before we move on, I'd like to notice that this formula that we've just played with here, 
looks eerily similar to what we get if we take a plus b plus c and we square it. So in fact, here we'll get a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus 2 ab plus ac plus bc. And in fact, for a general expansion, well, the same sort of pattern holds. And this is actually related to so-called multinomial coefficients. Now, that's not how we're writing this because that's not actually useful for our purposes. But, you know, there is something going on between these two concepts. Okay, so let's maybe prove this claim and then we'll apply it to our problem. So now we're ready to prove this claim, which we'll do with induction. So observe that the base case is done. We essentially did that during our exploration. So let's make an induction hypothesis as part of our induction step. So let's suppose for some m bigger than or equal to 1, we have, well, this second derivative rule for a product of m functions follows the pattern that we have down here in our claim. And now let's consider the next case. So we need to look at g1 all the way up to gm times gm plus 1 double prime. So now let's start by using maybe the two function version of this that we saw during our exploration where we're doing a grouping of functions so that g1 up to gm is playing the role of one of the functions and then gm plus 1 is the second function. So that's going to give us g1 up to gm double prime times gm plus 1 plus g or plus 2 times g1 up to gm prime times gm plus 1 prime and then plus g1 up to gm times gm plus 1 double prime. But now what we'll do is we'll replace this g1 up to gm double prime with, well, our induction hypothesis that we have up here, which I have starred in orange. And then for this next bit, this g1 up to gm prime, we can just use like the normal product rule. Okay, great. So let's see what we get for this. So here we'll have the sum as k goes from 1 up to m of g1 up to gk. We've got a double prime on that gk up to gm, and then that's multiplied into gm plus 1. So that's like that first term. And then we'll have plus twice this sum where i is less than j, and then they're going all between 1 and m g1 up to gi prime up to gj prime up to gm and then that's multiplied on to gm plus one. Okay nice. So all of that is um, maybe a descendant of this orange underline stuff. And then let's see what's happening for with that blue overline stuff. So that's gonna give us plus two and then we'll have the sum as uh, 1 is less than or equal to i, which is less than or equal to m, of g1 up to gi prime up to gm times gm plus 1 prime. So there what I did is I just used the product rule for that blue overline. So let's maybe color code this. Okay, great. And then we've got this last term on here, with it, which is this gm plus 1 double prime. So let's maybe put that down here. So plus g1 up to gm times gm plus 1 double prime. Okay, great. But now observe that we can absorb this term right here into the term above simply by changing the top index or the ending index to m plus 1 instead of m. Because that's all that's missing from this term above to, you know, what we would have. So let's do it just like that. So we're going to get rid of this and then we're going to absorb it into what we have above. Okay, great. And then observe that we can absorb all of this stuff with this blue overline into the term above as well. 
And that's simply by changing this top index again to m plus 1, because that's all that's missing here is a single derivative of m plus 1. So let's do that as well. So we'll cross all of this out and add an m plus 1 here. But now if you look at that closely, well, that's exactly what we needed to finish this proof by induction. Okay, so we've got this claim proven. So let's apply that to our problem. Okay, so now we're gonna apply our claim to our situation where this product G1 to Gn is our F sub n. So in the language of our claim, what we have here is G sub K of X is the cosine of Kx. Okay, but let's notice that means that G sub K of X prime is equal to K times the sine of kx, but then that means that gk double prime of x is equal to minus k squared times cosine of kx. Okay, so now let's use these in our formula down here. So we'll have f sub n double prime of x, so that's gonna be the sum as k goes from one up to n of well, our pure second derivatives. So that'll give me a minus k squared. And then we'll have, well, g1 up to gk double prime times gn, but in that case, we'll just get a product of all cosines. But the product of all cosines was our original function. So let's write it like that. So we've got f sub n of x. Because, well, we still have all of the cosines. We just picked up this multiplier of minus k squared. Okay. And then we've got this product of, well, our first derivative type terms. So we've got the sum as i is bigger than or equal to one, which is less than j, which is less than or equal to n of, well, we've got this derivative of, that'll be a cosine ix and a cosine jx. So that's gonna pick up a multiplication by i and then a multiplication by j. And then we'll have the cosine of x all the way up to, well, we've got a sine ix all the way up to a sine jx all the way up to a cosine nx, where that's a little bit sloppy, but I should point out that all of these terms here, except for the sine terms, are all cosine terms. So these are all cosine something. Okay, so now let's see where we can go from here. Well, we want the evaluation at zero, but actually that provides a lot of simplification. So let's observe that if we take f n double prime of zero, well, we'll end up with the sum as k goes from one to n of minus k squared times f sub n of zero, but that's simply the product of a bunch of cosines of zero, which is one. And then we'll have plus, well, that thing evaluated at zero, but sine of zero is zero, and we get a sine term in each of those. So those are simply gonna disappear. So now we can factor a minus sign out, and we'll see that we have the sum of the first n squares, but that has a fairly well-known formula. So we have minus n times n plus one times two n plus one all over six. Okay, nice. But we really want the absolute value, so let's look at that. We have the absolute value of Fn double prime of zero is n, n plus one, two n plus one over six. And now we just have to find the first n so that that is larger than 2023. And you might be wondering, well, what's the trick here? Well, in fact, there's not really much of a trick in this situation. It's really just some guessing and checking. There is something that you can do a little bit, and that is maybe just consider the top terms here to get a good first guess. So let's observe that if we just uh, consider the top terms, which are the n cubed terms, this thing looks like n cubed over three. So in fact, we're interested when n cubed over three is about 2,000. So when is this thing about equal to 2,000? 
Well, that's going to tell us that n cubed is about equal to 6,000. And then let's note that 20 cubed is approximately equal to, well, not as approximately, is actually equal to 8,000. So that tells us that 20 will definitely achieve a number bigger than 2023. And perhaps we should just work down from 20. And well, that just is a, maybe a little bit quicker than working up from zero. But that being said, you can guess and check from there and you'll observe that if you look at F double prime of 17, you get 1,785, which is strange because that's the year that I was born. And then if you look at F double prime of 18 evaluated at zero, you get 2,109. So there you have it. The first number where you achieve something bigger than 2023 is 18. And that's a good place to stop.